QuickBooks Online 2024 sales receipt form payment received at point of sale. Get ready and some coffee because we're getting our bookkeeping on track with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation. Opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports located on the left hand side. In the favorites, we're going to be right clicking on the balance sheet to open link in a new tab. Right click on the profit and loss to open link in a new tab. Right click the trial balance to open link in a new tab. If you don't have that trial balance in the favorites, you can search for it here. Tabbing to the right where the trusty balance sheet is located, closing the hamburger, changing the range for the first month of 2024. That being a 10124 tab, a 13124 tab. We will run it so we can refresh it, tabbing to the right, closing the hamburger, repeating the process, going from the range change, a 10124 tab, a 13124 tab. Run it to refresh it one more time, tabbing to the right, closing the hamburger, changing the range in from a 10124 tab, a 13124 tab. Run it so we can refresh it. Let's go back to the balance sheet. Quick recap. We started a new company file. We laid down the foundational items so that we can then start building our financial statement with the normal transactions by entering forms. Foundational items typically found under the cog with the company information like the account, the users, the lists like the chart of accounts, as well as the products and services. And we set up our customers, vendors, and employees. We pulled in our beginning balances starting the new software in uh, January of 2024. We entered some of the beginning information often done when you first start a company file, meaning you got to finance it. So we wanted cash. So how did we get to the cash? We either took a loan or we got cash from the owner putting money into the business. We then took that cash and purchased the stuff we need to make the business work, investing in the business by purchasing the fixed assets, in our case, furniture for our store, because we're gonna be selling guitars. And then we bought inventory. And that all took a lot of money and investment, but now we're making sales happen. So last time we looked at the sales process, we hit the plus button up top. These are our forms. We're now in the normal accounting cycle process, looking at the customer cycle, last time looking at the full accrual cycle where we entered an invoice and then we received the payment and then we're gonna make the deposit uh, from it. Now we wanna think about the uh, system which would be a cash register kind of system. So now we're imagining, say we're in our store and we're going to have a sales receipt, which is the form you can kind of imagine tied to a cash register in essence, because it's gonna record us receiving the payment at the same point in time, instead of invoicing the client to get paid at a future point in time. Let's take a quick look at the flowchart so we can fully understand that. This is the QuickBooks desktop homepage flowchart, but we're using it for online purposes because it's just the flow of the forms that's typical for any accounting cycle. And I think it's a pretty well laid out sheet. So. We're in the sales cycle this time, so or the customer cycle, sales cycle, revenue cycle. At the end of it, we expect there to be a deposit of some sort because we're gonna be receiving money for goods and services that we provide. Last time, we did the full accrual process, entering an invoice, typical for something like a job cost system, bookkeepers will do this. 
the uh, the landscapers will do this, law firms will do this. They do the work first, then they invoice the client. But in our case, we imagined that we provided the the inventory and build the client so that we can practice the invoice. Then we receive the payment, and then we we imagined we put it into a clearing account because we then wanted to group it in the same format as we'll hit our checking account. So then we deposited it into the checking account. We have a similar thing if we have a cash based system, which is basically what we're talking about with the sales receipt. Now we're on a cash based system, not because we just chose to be on a cash based system, but because the way our structure is set up, we're going to get paid at the same time we do the work. So you could still basically call it an accrual system that you're using. It's just that it doesn't matter which system you use if you're going to get paid at the same time you do the work under a cash or accrual system you will get the same transaction right the difference happens when there's a difference between when you get paid and when you do the work so in other words if i had a system where i invoiced clients and then received payments and then i said i was on a cash based system well when i record the invoice then it wouldn't actually record anything because that would be an accrual transaction. Nothing would be recorded until we receive the payment. If on the other hand, we're gonna get paid at the same point in time, both the cash and accrual system would record the same thing, but for different reasons. Cash system, because we received cash at that point in time, accrual system, because we did the work at that point in time, right? So the forms are really what drives if we're on a cash and accrual system, okay. Note that the easiest cash based system would be one where you don't enter a sales receipt form at all and you just record a deposit. You're like, why don't I just do that? Why don't I just wait till something clears the bank and then I record the deposit when it clears the bank to revenue? You can do that if you're in a system or a business that allows you to do that. Meaning if you're in like gig work, you get paid by YouTube or something. Well, that's really easy. You can wait till the money clears the bank, use the deposit form to record the revenue and that's fine. But if you're at a cash register situation where you have multiple people paying you throughout the day, then you, you don't typically want to do that because you want the internal controls that are going to go along with recording each of the sales. So if you're, if as the sales happen, we're going to enter the sales receipts and provide the goods or services, the inventory in our case at this point in time, and then we'll receive the payment. The payment might come in multiple forms. We could get cash, we could get checks, although that's more rare these days. We could get some other kind of electronic transfer uh, or, or uh, we could have a credit card. Now let's imagine a cash situation again because it's easy to physically visualize. If we have a cash register and we receive cash, if we put it directly into the bank every time we receive cash, let's imagine we had you know 20 sales of $5 well, then it, if I put it directly into the, the checking account, when I receive it, it, it's not physically in the checking account when we get the money. And what's going to happen at the end of the day, we're going to take those $100 and put it in the bank, not as 20 separate $5 deposits, but as $20. So what we want to do then is put it into this clearing account. We have this issue where we want to use a clearing account to then make sure that when we make the deposit on our end, it will match what actually will show up on the bank statement side so that when we tie out our books to the bank statement, possibly with the bank feeds, that will be an easy process. And if you're using any kind of electronic transfer there, where there's an intermediary, you're gonna possibly have a similar system. So if it was a credit card company that you're receiving payments from, well, they might charge you fees and they, they're going to uh, group your payments together and deposit them into the checking account in a lump sum of some kind. So if, so that means that you can't just sell things and put it directly into the checking account because you won't be able to reconcile. You won't be able to, to tie things out to the bank feeds and reconcile. Uh, so what we want to do then is use some kind of clearing account, think about and, and correlate what we're doing with what the, the credit card company is doing in terms of the grouping of their payments so that we can then take the money out of our undeposited funds and deposit them in a format that will match and we'll be able to uh, do our reconciliation process. All right, so that's what we'll do this time. So let's go ahead and do it. So we're gonna go into uh, the first tab over here and we're gonna select the drop down, and we're like, we're imagining we're in the store 
And instead of an invoice, we're going right to the sales receipt form. And I'm going to say that we got a sales receipt. We're just going to make up a customer called String Music. That's the customer's name. Yeah, I know it's a creative name. I'm getting creative over here. Now, we might want to put all a lot of information in from the customer, but if you're at a cash register, a lot of times you might not do that. You might not even get their name. You might just be using generic customer because you might not be gathering all their information. If you work at like a food truck or something like that or a restaurant, you're not gathering other people's names other than to call out their name so you can get their seat ready, you know, at some time, right? So other stores, however, you might want to gather as much information as possible uh, with them if they're going to be a repeat client. So just keep that in mind. I'm going to say save on this one. We don't need to email it, but if you wanted to email it, you have the capacity to do that, which could be nice these days because then you have like that electronic receipt. Send later if you so choose. We're going to say the date. I'm going to make it on the 19th of 2024. And then the sales receipt number, I will allow it to populate on its own. I'll keep uh, the location, which could be useful for the recording of the sales tax. And then the, the tags, we're not going to add any tags. The payment methods. Now, we're receiving payments here. So it could be cash, could be check, could be credit card. There could be some other electronic payment. Maybe they're paying with, with PayPal or something. You can add other things as well. I'm going to once again choose the cash because I want to imagine it going in and out of the, the checking account. Now, note with a sales receipt, if you're at a cash register and if you only accept things like a check or possibly some kind of electronic transfer that goes directly into your bank account, then you might be able to just deposit it directly into the checking account and you would be okay. So that in that case, this form would be what is increasing your checking account at this point in time. Because in that case, you're not going to have an issue with other payments or fees possibly that are going to mess up the deposit so it doesn't match what is actually going into your bank account. But if you're, coll if you're collecting multiple things, like you, sometimes people pay you with a credit card, you're trying to have multiple payment options to increase the likelihood that people can do business with you, then what you're going to need to do is put, put the information into undeposited funds typically and label which form of payment that you have as a general rule just to make a uniform process and then basically take this information, take the money out of undeposited funds and deposit it into the bank in the format that will match what actually physically goes into the bank. So I'm going to say cash because I think that's easiest to follow. If there was a reference number, like a check number, we can put it here. Or if it was a transfer, we can put it there. I'm not going to put it into the checking account, but rather in payments due to deposit, which is the same as undeposited funds, which is what they used to call it. But they're changed. They got to change everything. They got to change things over there to warrant, you know, their job, I, I suppose. Right? Everything has to change every, every once in a while over at the online section. So what are we selling? We're going to imagine they came up with a GSB, which is a Gibson uh, SG. And we're now imagining, so notice it gives you how many we have on hand here. So we're going to, and we're going to sell one of those. Okay. That's good because we brought them in with that ukulele. It's like, it's only a $20 ukulele, but then we sold it. Then we sold them this $777 Gibson SG. That's how it's done. I'm just kidding. That's not how it's done. That's not nice. If they want a ukulele, we will sell you a ukulele. We will not pressure anybody to be buying whatever they don't. And then an ELP. And we're going to say that that's our stock. That's our standard. And we're going to sell three of those. And at 500 for 1,500. And sales tax is being applied out. This looks much like the invoice form. Same kind of process, except instead of whereas the invoice form goes into the accounts receivable, this is going to go into cash, but we're putting it into the clearing account of payments to deposit. And then down below, so these are this is adding it up, and then uh, sales tax will be calculated. There it goes. Okay, sales tax has been calculated. Now it's based on location here. I don't want it to be based on location. I'm gonna use the generic five because we set up the generic five before if you don't have the generic five set up and you want to follow along, then you can just see the math right here and change the math and then just tell QuickBooks to, to do the 5%. It'll ask you why and 
and as if as if I have to explain myself to you, QuickBooks. Why? Because I said so. That's why I'm the one that's paying your salary, QuickBooks. So there it is. So there. So then, if we, what's the journal entry going to do? Well, the, and then of course, if you look at the rest of the form, right? So there's this. We've got the ad lines, clear lines. We've got the message to play, displayed on the sales receipt. So you might put a message on it. Message to, displayed on statement. You can have attachments. You can cancel. You can clear. You can print or preview it here. Make it reoccurring. You can customize the form. Note that this form might be something that you give as a standard process to your client. You might email it to them, kind of like a receipt that you would that you used to get, you know, at a cash register. But it might just be an internal form as well. Uh, because because the invoice is certainly something that you would give to the client because you have to give it to them because they're going to pay you later. But if you're getting paid at the same point in time, then you may or may not you know be providing the sales receipt as an external form. If it is a form that you're providing to the client, then you you might want to customize it and put your logo on it and that kind of stuff. What's going to be the the journal entry when we record this? Well, it's similar to the accounts receivable, but instead of increasing accounts receivable, it's I'm sorry, it's similar to the invoice, but instead of increasing accounts receivable, we're increasing some kind of cash, but we're going to put it into the clearing account payments to deposit. The rest is basically the same as an invoice. We're increasing the the other side's going to going to be going to revenue for 2277, not including the sales tax. Sales tax will be going up by 11385, that's a sales tax payable balance sheet account, and then we're going to have the inventory going down by an amount that's not on the actual form but driven by the items. The system knows it we're using a perpetual inventory system. Cost of goods sold and expense account will be going up for the same amount that inventory went down by, by the cost of the inventory. Net impact on net income will be the sales price minus the cost of goods sold. And the subledger for the inventory will in, be impacted by units of uh, inventory. So I think that's it. Let's save it. Uh, we're going to save and close it. We could send it if we were had an email address that we wanted to send to. Let's check it out going on over to the balance sheet. Let's refresh it. So we're not working in stale stuff. We want to work with, I only work with fresh stuff like fresh food is, I only eat, well, that's not true. I, I eat possibly not the fresh, I'm not like, anyway, but whatever. I'm going to go in, it didn't go into the checking account. It went into the payment and deposit. Let's go into the payment and deposit area. And we have then the the item of the sales receipt. So there it is, boom. If I go into it, that's for the full amount, including the sales tax. The sales tax has been included, boom. All right, let's close that out. Where's the other side going? There's two accounts affected at least because it's a transaction. One's gonna be on the income statement. Let's run it to refresh it. It's in the sale of product line. Let's go into that one. And there it should be. There's the sales receipt. I put it in two line items because it's trying to track it line by line, possibly to help track the cost, the inventory on a first in, first out basis, I believe. There's the two amounts. It doesn't include the sales tax though. Where did the sales tax go? Because it's not in balance right now. So where's the other side? It's on the balance sheet. It's on the balance sheet in the liability accounts under our two sales tax places that we are going to have to pay just like you know how this works if you've ever been shaken down by the local thug that the local thugs just just the government now so it's going to be sales tax boom we pay that we're going to go back but i thought if i pay the local thug sales tax i, st I wouldn't have to pay the local thug and the t sales tax that's not apparently that's not how it works you have to pay multiple protection monies but in any case then the inventory if I go into the inventory, then uh, it's going to go do, 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 do. So there's the sales receipt. It's going down by amounts that are not actually on the form because it's driven by the items, but not on the form closing that out. And then if I go back into the P&L again, the cost of goods sold is the other side of that one. So that's the expense of us selling the inventory for these two items. All right, let's go back. So the net impact on net income is the revenue 
minus the cost of the goods sold. Let's go back to the balance sheet. And then we note that that the inventory is going to have a sub ledger breaking it out by unit. Let's take a look at that. We'll go to the tab to the right, right click on it, duplicate it. And then we're going to go down to the reports on the left hand side. And let's type in uh, inventory valuation summary. And so there we have it as of let's go 013124. 013124 run it so here's the quantity here's the values we're at 38878 that's the amount if we go to the balance sheet we have the 38878 over here as well so if i go into the internal reports i can track this information if i had questions by whoever purchased it right but it's likely i'm not going to use this as much if I'm making payments at the point of sale, which is more of a cash-based system. So if I go to the sales, uh, then, and why is that the case? Because I'm not trying to collect on the receivables. I have the benefit now of getting paid when I do the work and not having to worry so much on trying trying to make sure I'm not doing business with deadbeats, right, that aren't going to pay me. So then, so if I go into here, we could say, okay, here's the, all transaction. We can look at basically the sales receipts. We can sort it this way. It's been paid. Great. I can go into, it's not going to be in the invoices, but I can also go to the customers and I can go to recent transactions or recent paid. I think it'll still be in there. And we had string music. So if we go into string music, then we can see it. So if string music contacts us and has questions, we can answer them, but we're not in here so much managing what is going on if you're at like a food truck for example or something like that or a restaurant you're just making sales all days you're that's which is a tough job but you're not having the job which is also very tough of trying to collect on the accounts receivable uh if i go into here then here's our uh information and the track of the information you can edit the form to go back into the form this way as well all right, let's close this one out. Let's go back into the balance sheet again, noting that the payment went into the payments to deposit account, which is basically a cash type of account. So again, you would kind of think it would be under here, under the bank account area, because if it was normal external reporting, we would be calling it cash and cash equivalents. But for QuickBooks, they're breaking out the different types of account by functionality of account. So the checking account would be connected to the bank feed. So that's one reason it's down here because it acts like an other current asset account, even though it is a cash account. In other words, if you wanted to tie out your cash to the statement of cash flows, for example, and you had money in the payments to deposit, you need to make sure that you include that when you're trying to reconcile that, that statement. If I go into here, you can see that we had the payments and then this was the sales receipt that went into this account. If we took this sales receipt and deposited it directly into the checking account, it would show up in the checking account as a sales receipt and an increase to the checking account, which may be fine as long as we have a system where that's not going to cause us a problem due to the grouping of payments. So in other words, if I go back uh, here, we're going to move this into the checking account. Note when we move it into the checking account, which will typically be done, say, nightly, for example, that's why it's not a big issue that this isn't really up here in, in this area because it should be zero very shortly at the end of each night or something like that. But if I went into the checking account and we deposited it in here with the sales receipt form, note that instead of seeing a deposit on the increase, you would see a sales receipt form. That makes it a little bit difficult to filter because if I filter over here, it's typical that we filter by type. So if I wanted to filter again, it's a transaction type. If I want to look at the increases, I would usually filter by the deposits to see the increases. But if we have other things that are increased in the checking account, like sales receipts forms or receive payment forms, then you've got to take that into account. That's not a big deal. That's not a problem. But it is kind of nice to have all of your increases basically be deposit type forms because it's a little bit easier to do things like filter. Okay, so let's go back. Now, also note that we're going to then deposit this into the checking account in the same format as we expect to see on the 
in the checking account. So if this is cash payments, we're going to, at the end of the day, take all the cash payments and deposit them into the bank as one lump sum. So if I go to the first tab over here, if I hit the plus button, I won't deposit it now, but just to show the process, if I go into the bank deposit, you will see that now we have these items up top, which are coming from the payment form, which is the form that we get to collect after we issue an invoice and the sales receipt forms. If these were all cash transactions that happened in one day, for example, it's likely that we would deposit the whole thing, 22,890,85 into the bank at one time. And that's why we have the clearing account. That's why they have this whole system set up because that's the amount that's gonna actually be on the bank statement and will pull through with the bank feeds if you're using bank feeds. If you deposit these one at a time, What's gonna happen when you reconcile either with the bank reconciliation or the bank feeds, you're gonna to have to match out multiple transactions on our side to one deposit on the bank side. You don't wanna to have to do that. The reconciliation should be easy. It's gonna be a more efficient system if you can find a way to use the clearing account method as they have set up here so that when you get to the bank reconciliation, it should be a snap, like there's my snap. Okay, so let's go back on over and uh, let's do another one. Uh, let's do another one. Let's go to the plus button up top and we'll say we want another, we're at the cash register again, another sales receipt. And we're going to call this, this is going to go to Sam the Guitar Man. Catchy name, right? I'm getting such, I like to keep things interesting here. So I'm just going to use the minimum data. I'm not going to add the email, although if you wanted to email it to them as a receipt, you would want the email. We'll keep it at the 19th again. And let's tab down, tab down the payment method. I'm going to just imagine cash again, uh, just to just to keep it consistent here. But we might have multiple payment methods. We're not going to put it into the checking account. If we did, it would show in the checking account, not as a deposit form, but as a sales receipt form, which could be fine. But just note that. And then we're going to put it into the, the clearing account. And let's put some amounts. This time we'll just do some service items. So we'll imagine they came up for service. Now these sound like more like uh, car service items, but we're just to get the idea. We have a diagnostic that we're gonna do on a guitar, which means like we just like check out the guitar and have, have it stick out its tongue and so that we can <laughs> see if its throat's okay or something. I don't know what that actually is, but we're going to do one of those and then we have the hourly hourly service one which again is a generic service item so sorry it's kind of generic here i could have done better but just we're just trying to do a generic service item here as opposed to the inventory item and then we're going to say tuning support so we have tuning support uh as well <laughs> which means we're going to help you tune the guitar I, th I think tuning support is basically an app on your on your phone these days. Uh, you don't really need possibly our help for that usually in the guitar shop, but people still come into the shop for tuning support because of the beautiful furniture that we put in there. So I don't even know, they don't even know what they're asking for with these. So I don't even know what we're doing, but we have such nice furniture that they still come in. We give them some coffee and we lounge around as we do the diagnostic hourly service and tuning support stuff. So the point is though, that this is not inventory items, therefore it's not subject to the sales tax. So it's a lot easier, or, or this sales tax will be dependent on location. So we're gonna imagine that the service items aren't subject to sales tax in our case, and the inventory items are subject to sales tax. Remembering that in the United States, sales tax is a state and local tax. So you gotta go by whatever the rules are. If you're in other countries, then of course, the double entry accounting system is the same and taxes are, there's no new taxes under the sun either. Governments have been, have figured out all, all the ways that they can tax that are plausible ways to tax. Uh, the only thing, these, the only thing that's happening now is to decide what's the type of tax that the current government's going to hit you with, right? And so then they, what kind of combination they can get creative by combining them together and stuff like that. So, so then, so whatever tax that they're using, which oftentimes is like a usage tax for, for in other countries, for example, then uh, you'll have a similar kind of, kind of system. So the accounting system is the same. The currency will be changed. 
for whatever currency you're in. You figure out what kind of what kind of tax the current uh, government is hitting you with, and and then you and then you go from there. But we're saying that we're not being we're not being used as the business owner to collect the sales tax in this case, which makes it a lot easier. And we don't have to deal with inventory, which is also a lot easier. And it's not an invoice, so we don't have to track the accounts receivable. So this is great. So we're gonna imagine it's $5,180, which is, seems uh, quite high for that kind for the, the service, but whatever, this is just a practice problem. And what's gonna happen? Well, it's a sales receipt. It's gonna increase some kind of cash account, which is gonna be the clearing account. And the other side is gonna be going into uh, simply a revenue account. This time, not the product revenue, but service revenue driven by these items don't have to deal with inventory, don't have to deal with accounts receivable, don't have to deal with sales tax, don't have to deal with cost of goods sold. This is this is the life. This is the kind of accounting I want to see happen. So let's record it, check it out. Let's go to the balance sheet and let's going to run it. And we're going to say that it went into payments to deposit. Let's go into there and check it out. It just put it in there in one lump sum because we didn't have to uh, break it out uh, in any way. There's the 5180. Let's go back. The other side's in the P and the L, the profit and the loss. The uh, income statement, in other words, it went into a new line, the service line, going into that. So here we have it. It still put it in there line, uh, line by line for the three service items that we had, but it's going to be uh, the same number, the same sales receipt. So let's go on back. Notice that we don't have any cost of goods sold related to it. So the net impact on net income or the impact on net income, the increase in net in income is the impact on both the gross profit and the bottom line, the net income of the sales receipt when we sold the service item, not subject to the sales tax or the inventory, which would result in cost of goods sold. If I go internally over here, and we check it out on this side, we could go to the, I'm in the sales area. We could go into all sales items once again, and we're looking at sales receipts. There's our list of sales receipts. We're not having to manage over here as much because we're not tracking the receivables, but if the customer came in and wanted to ask some questions, we can go into the recent transactions. We're like, oh yeah, I remember you, Sam, the guitar man. And we can go into their information. Yeah, we sold you this uh these service items and uh it was it was uh in our beautiful shop with a nice furniture and guitars hanging all over the place and whatnot and it was good times so there's that all right let's see where we stand at this point in time we're here's the balance sheet this is where we are at we made changes to uh the the payments to deposit we're going to make the deposits at a future point in time. We just wanted to show how these uh, payments to deposit will be affecting the deposit uh, form, as we can see over here, because that 2870, if I go back on over here, will be in the deposit form now, and we can combine them together. So both the payment and the sales receipt type forms could impact uh, the deposit form. There's the 2870 that is supporting that. So we'll take care of that later. And then here's where we stand on the income statement. Let's run it to refresh it. So we're making some, we're making some money. We're not, we haven't broke even by any means yet due to all that nice furniture we bought and everything, but we're still, we're getting there. It's just a matter of time. So here's the trial balance. We're standing on our own two legs now, the debit leg and the credit leg, the left and the right leg. We they're kind of lopsided because like the upper leg is stronger here and the lower leg it's because we like to work out with skateboarding which isn't like an even like running so you end up with like a thigh up here that's and then the calf on the lower muscles down here but it's still okay but in any case then uh uh we can just see here this is the balance sheet on top of the income statement if your numbers tie out to these numbers that's great but uh if not then you can try changing the date increasing the date and then if it's a date issue, drill down onto the source document and then possibly change the date on the source document. So we have our assets, cash. We've got the accounts receivable, inventory. These are all assets in investment, the payments to deposit. That's still an asset account. 
the accumulated depreciation, that's the contra asset account. So instead of a debit, it's a credit because it's decreasing the asset furniture and, and fixture asset account, and then the liability. So this is all what the company owns. Who has claim to that? The other side of the coin. Well, liabilities like the accounts payable, our vendors, the financial institution for the credit card company, the government wants their piece. And so whatever. We got the loan payable. So the bank and then we have claim to some of it too. We have a little bit of claim to our work down here. It's not all being taken by the government and the bank. So we've got the owner investment and the owner's equity and then the income statement, which is also part of equity that's gonna roll in to the equity. We sold stuff in this current period for the sale of products and some services and then the cost of goods sold decreases the equity, right? These are increases to the equity, decreases to the equity. We can scrunch down the income statement to one number, which would be 10,107 plus the 5180 minus the 8062. That's the 7225 found on the income statement, the 7225 there. And that then rolls in to the balance sheet. So in other words, if I looked at this trial balance and I took it up to the next year, these two numbers will be squished together and be included in the owner's equity. Let's check that out just for the fun of it. Let's go from 010125 to 123125. Run it. Doesn't do it on a monthly basis because QuickBooks closes it out on a yearly basis. Then we have no income statement here. You can see that on the balance sheet too. Here's the net income. If I bring it up to the next year, just for the fun, 010125, 123125, run it. And there it is. See, I told you that would be fun. We did it just for the fun of it. And it was a good time. I told you it would be. So we'll do this more stuff next time.